let's uh, let's focus in. Uh, we're looking at right now District 13, which is Paia, Haiku, Hana, Molokai, and Lanai. Certainly a very big district. And uh, for our first interview, uh, we have Walter Ritty. And Sean Lester is going to start off by doing a little introduction, and then we'll go from there. Aloha Kaku, Walter. Thank you for being here today. Um, you're on mute, so you may want to take your, your, uh, your mute off. First of all, we really want to thank you for stepping forward. Um, I know personally that from the ability to be able to, to, to walk in and take on uh, an incumbent and looking at moving into the state legislature, there must have been something here that really, uh, in, really step, really put you forward. You've been working tirelessly for most of your life for uh, the Aina and for the people. And first of all, we want to thank you very much for stepping forward. Um, we know it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it's a, a major change in lifestyle if you win this seat to be able to go to the legislature. And I, we also understand the, the kind of uh, impact it can have on your family and your lifestyle. So thank you so much for, for doing that. And that does lead me to the first question I have for you. And the question is, what is it at this point in time um, that's, that's having you step forward and run for this position, for the state house position? Well, <clears throat> I don't have any specific idea of what I want to accomplish when I've decided to go ahead and become a politician. And when I went to the island of Kaha'olawe, I had no idea that I was going to get involved the way I got involved. But I went because I was listening to my na'au. My na'au is my gut feeling. And for Hawaiians, if you want your kupuna or your elders to talk to you, um, they talk to you through your na'au and not through your, your brain. So when I went to um, the Constitutional Convention, it was the same thing. I didn't plan on going. I just followed my na'au. When I went up to Mauna Kea and tied myself to the guardrails, the cattle guardrails, it wasn't because I was trying to think about what I wanted to accomplish. I just knew I had to do that and I followed my na'au. Um, because of what was happening up at Mauna Kea and I saw the Hawaiian community coming together like it's never done before, for some reason, the end result was an idea that it is time to get into the middle of the battle instead of fighting always on the outside, trying to get things accomplished. So basically, it was a gut feeling that this was the right thing to do and this was the right time to do it. Okay, thank you. Out of, out of in the last, say, uh, 15 years in, in either local government on the county level or on the state level, who is it that you would say in say two people that have really been people that have been your guiding light or somebody that you have great respect for? Are you talking about in politics? It can be in the Hawaiian, it can be in state politics, it can be county politics. Uh, people within our state that have been people that have given you uh, vision or have been people that have, have, have had great influence on you. Well, the thing that keeps me going is watching the young people mm. come up and take their positions. Um, a lot of times you, you can do all of the hard work and then when you die, psh, it's gone. So in this case, I'm always trying to work with the younger generation and I've seen what they know at their age. And I look back and I try to remember what I knew when I was their age, there is no comparison. The educational system that I went through was based on making us all good Americans. And the educational system now that's coming up, they're actually telling the truth of our history and they're making us proud that we had a language, proud that we had a culture. And the next generation has so much more uh, facts and truth about who we are because they know now who we were. So for me, that's, that's the driving force that keeps me going is to see that in the future, there's gonna be great accomplishments. I appreciate that. 
Is there any particular part of the state constitution that you feel um, is uh, is is in need of 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 uh, bolstering or or being held up? Is there some is there some part of it that you know that you see that's either been pushed aside or that really needs to be worked with in the legislature? Yeah, what what bothers me a lot is the constitution says that the Office of Foreign Affairs we get 20% of all of the ceded land revenues. And the legislature decided, uh, we're not gonna do that. And they put a cap on it. And they own, OHA is only getting a fraction mm -hmm. of what the constitution says they should get. So that's a signal to us as Hawaiians that we really don't have the manpower or the influence at our legislative level. And it's stopping us from getting what our constitution says we should be getting. And same with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. In the Constitution, it spells out what funds, um, what things in Hawaiian Homeland that needs to have funding. And I think there was a list of four things, and the legislature decided that they're only going to do one of those four. So mm -hmm. it's important for us as Hawaiians to get involved more in the local level at the legislature in order for us to get the things that we worked for in 1978 at the Constitutional Convention. So those are the, the main things that I have in mind in trying to figure out how do we get our legislative body to follow the laws of our Constitution. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Daniel. Aloha, Walter. Aloha. Thanks for showing up. Good to have a conversation with you. Um, you know, you you definitely have a, a history of community service, so um, I'm interested to hear your reflections. Let's start off with this question. As a public representative, it is the duty to face the truth and to act righteously. These islands reflect the lowest voter turnout in the United States. On May 15, 2019, Dr. David Keanu Sai gave a presentation to the Maui County Council evidencing the illegal overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani in 1893 and showing clear violation of domestic and international law with the ongoing illegal United States military occupation of the Kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands. As a candidate for public representation, how do you rectify handling the truth of Dr. Sai's presentation, as well as the works of Kamoku Kapu, Henry Noah, Amelia Gora, Bumpy Kanahele, Leon Su, Dr. Desaius, Madame Ruth Bolome, the Kohabai Pai Aina office in Hilo, et cetera. How do you rectify the compliance of the law and restoration of occupied lands? Yeah, what, what these people are doing is they're trying to let people know what the truth is. So they're seeking the truth. And as Hawaiians, we've always been trying to seek the truth. And like I said earlier, um, the whole purpose after the overthrow was to make us good Americans. It was to denationalize the Hawaiian people. One of the first things they wanted to do was take away our language. And that was a statement that came, came out of the first president of Kamehameha schools. So it was a plan. Um, it was planned that they were gonna make sure that all of the Hawaiian became Americanized and were denationalized. So what we're, what we're seeing happening now is that out of the University of Hawaii, some of those names that you mentioned, they all got their degrees and their PhDs and they know what the truth is. So now their job is to go out and educate the public and to even like Keanu Sai did, educate the government. Him going to the Maui County Council was a huge step because he's telling the council that you are based on an illegal action done since 1893. And that is the first step in making things right here in Hawaii, is to first tell the truth and then figure out how do you solve the problem of rectifying the truth. So he's not only telling people the truth, but he's also saying, this is how you solve the problem. And it's no different than people who went to Japan after the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They went there and they signed over 
after seven years of negotiations, they signed the country back over to them and it's called deoccupation. So when we went to Iraq and we took over the government, we did not run the country according to American laws, but according to their laws. And then the idea was to do the same thing they did in Japan, which is to take over and then stabilize and then give the government back their powers. That's the same process that Keanu Sai is trying to get done. It's called deoccupation. And it's something that the international community understands and they do that all the time. So the idea is to get the international community to realize that Hawaii is occupied according to international law. And that's the process that is going on right now. And it's a complicated process. And it's a process that takes a lot of learning and trust. And us as Hawaiians, we're going to have to learn how to live our that truth. All right, mahalo, Walter. I'm going to pass okay. a, a question on to the next, and I'll come back with more. OK. <laughs> uh, Walter. Um, you've done so many different things in your public life. Some people are going to know you as a uh, Ko'olawe activist, some as a GMO activist, some as a Hawaiian separatist. Uh, everyone's going to know you as a different persona. Uh, how are you going to rectify all these different personas that you have out in the public and and unify that into the persona that you're trying to present? Well, I'm not done yet. There's going to be a lot more personas that are going to come out. And I'm hoping to get into office and start a whole new one. So I, I, I don't spend time looking back about what I've done or how people view me or anything. There's not enough time to do that. I'm always trying to look ahead. Like right now, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, wow, this, this pandemic has given us a huge pause. Everybody has stopped. They're actually looking at life without tourism. You know, for me, it's like, yes, they're gonna enjoy what they're seeing, even though they're locked up in their homes, sooner or later, they're gonna say, I don't wanna go back to that lifestyle anymore. So I'm looking at things in a positive way, and I'm sure everybody has a different persona of, as to how they're looking at me. And I'm not really concerned about that. All I'm concerned about is how we're gonna organize the people outside of the system to start working inside of the system so we can organize the people inside the system. And if someone were to see you as a Hawaiian separatist, how would you respond to that type of view? I would just say what I said earlier. Um, all I'm trying to do is follow international law. We, we understand county law, we understand state law, we understand federal law, but very few of us understand international law. So I'm trying to understand international law. And if, if the word separatist is used, um, I don't use that word separatist. Um, I use the word, all we're trying to do is deoccupied and occupied nation. Thank you. And um, how, um, how would you say what, what qualifies you for our office in the state legislature? If someone asked, what are your qualifications? What qualifies you for this type of job? What would be your response? Um, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all I know is there's something I got to do and I've been trying to do it outside of the system. And I've accomplished a lot of things outside of the system. So I'm gonna take the same skills that I had outside the system and go inside the system. Um, I see myself as like a Trojan, a Trojan horse going into the city and bringing all the guys that I know with me and trying to see how much changes we can make inside of that city. And it's going to take my ability to organize my friends who've been 
working outside the system to join me inside the system and support me to get things done inside the system. Thank you. And um, um, oh, I had a great question. What was it? <laughs> Come join me inside the system. I'm gonna, yes. I'm going to need all the help I can get. <laughs> So okay, uh, with let, that, I'll let pass. Me, let me let me jump in here, Bruce. Then, and then we'll have Laura. Um, a, a question, uh, Walter, about the situation around water. Certainly, the lifeblood of the Ina. And uh, a question I have is: Do you see a necessity for full financial disclosure and transparency for members of the Board of Land and Natural Resources? who effectively make decisions involving hundreds of millions of dollars of natural resources, often for the benefit of private business interest. Uh, and, and they're volunteers, uh, supposedly. So if elected, what would you do to bring about the needed changes around this whole issue uh, and the governance by this board? Well, it's... It's really obvious um, because we're in a situation now um, where we're beginning to recognize that the system um, not only needs to be changed, but we're in a position now where we can change the system. And the system has, it's, it's the, it, it works for some people and it works for the people that has power and they use that power to take over the government via changing laws to allow them to even have more power. So that is happening at the federal level and is also happening at the state level. So the everyday person on the streets, they're losing the ability to have a voice um, in that system. And they have very little power now in that system. It's to a point where now they're pretty much fed up with that system, the way it's already set up. Um, you can go and testify to your blue in the face and they give you three minutes and then their lobbyists come in every day and they take them to lunch and they spend all the time in their offices. That system is totally set up for the very powerful to get what they want and for the people on the streets and the everyday person to have a very small voice in the government. So when I go in there, I'm gonna try and figure out how to bring people with me. If I'm gonna say, I wanna accomplish X, I'm gonna make sure all the people that I've worked with all of these years come and support me on X. And I'm gonna to have to make sure that they all agree that X is what we wanna accomplish and then come in as a group to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Otherwise, we're blowing smoke and it's not getting done and it's not working. And I feel that I can go in there. The only problem I'm gonna have is I don't know how the people who are already in there are gonna view myself. If they view me as a threat, I'm gonna have a hard time so I'm going to try and figure out how not to be a threat. And the only way I can figure out how not to be a threat is to make sure that I can have a huge organized bunch of people that are willing to even get arrested in order to get X done. So right. somehow figure out how to manage that system by organizing. I understand, Walter. Again, I think I, you know, in terms of systemic change and really going about looking at how we can really shift this dynamic that's been so corrupt for so long for so many issues, not everything, but a lot of issues. Uh, again, going back to the Board of Land and Natural Resources, they seem to be a kingpin in terms of uh, the management of our resources. Um, what are, are, is there anything specific? I, I hear about organizing and getting people, the community engaged and knowledgeable and have them participate 
uh, is there any specific thing that you would do to help create a shift within that board that is presently existing? Well, <clears throat> one of the low hanging fruit uh, regarding DLNR is the fact that we went out after, I don't know, four or five years of organizing and we created what they call the Ahamoku. The Ahamoku is created by state law and the law says that this group of people are gonna be the advisors for environmental um, issues to DLNR. So that took a lot of work. The problem was DLNR decided that they were gonna ignore us. And not only ignore us, but corrupt us. And just yesterday, there were hearings at Water and Land. The governor, all of a sudden, after three years of doing nothing, decides he's gonna appoint the people that represent each of the islands in this advisory group in my law. And the law is very specific as to how you pick three names, each island, AHA picks three names, gives it to the governor, and then the governor picks out of the three names. At the hearing, all of the names that the governor brought in, none of the AHAs knew about what was going on. And they were, Molokai, we've sent in our three names two years ago and have been ignored. So it's not going to be easy working with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, but that's one of the things that we're going to get straightened is we're going to give that, that state law that gives us a voice that advises DLNR. The other thing is those lands that DLNR manages, those million acres that they have so that they can make money for whatever uses of the lands. And those monies, as I mentioned earlier, goes to the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and goes to Hawaiian homes and all kinds of different things. <clears throat> the problem we have is that those lands, according to Keanu Sai and others, those are those so-called ceded lands are illegal lands and the, the Hawaiians are now making a big push to either get a huge portion of those lands or to get those lands back. Those were the government lands for the Hawaii, um, in the Hawaiian kingdom. So those are just two ways of us putting pressure on DLNR um, to make better use of the lands and for us as Hawaiians to have a voice on the DLNR board. The existing law says that there should be a Hawaiian voice on the DLNR board for Hawaiian issues to be heard. And lo and behold, they pick a non-Hawaiian to represent that seat. So we're pretty much irritated to the max about how DLNR is running their show. And at first we used to go to the legislature and say, 1% of the budget is not enough for them to take care of our resources. Give them more money so we can give our resources. We're losing our fish. We're screwing up our, our mountain resources. They're not getting enough rainwater. All those kinds of issues that we care about. We were saying, give them more money. Last year, they go to the legislature and ask for a million dollars to buy more rifles and guns to fight the Hawaiians because the Hawaiians were getting too boisterous and aggressive in what they feel should be done with those lands. So it's a really technical and difficult situation, but it's a high priority on my list and a high priority for Hawaiians to rectify those DLNR lands so that number one, we protect them for the future generations and number two, that it's used in a proper way. Great. Thank you, Walter, for that, for that insight and going into the detail. Yeah, I'm sorry uh, it took so long. For no, no, no. This is, this, this is what this is about and getting into this type of insight. So, uh, Laura, uh, you'll be next. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hi, Walter. Aloha. So, hi. 
So my question is, is um, becoming a Hawaiian nation, a lot of people are feel threatened by that, especially, you know, if they're not Hawaiian and they've lived here all their lives and they're afraid what will happen if they'll lose their land or um, what a change would, of like that would be. Well, if you look at, the, um, I mentioned earlier how uh, they deoccupied Japan after they bombed those poor guys to yeah. to hell. Um, <clears throat> so that process is a is a process that is managed by the international community. Okay. So that process took seven years. So you don't go in there and just flip everything upside down. Mm -hmm. It has to be a, a slow changeover. So what happens is they declare a, some kind of a martial law. So the United States has control and then they follow only the laws of that nation. So if Hawaii was to denationalize or deoccupy rather, um, we, would, we would have to follow international law and the international process. So it's a process that makes sure that there's no collapse. So there's really very little to be afraid of. Um, for Hawaiians, it's a lot for us to be able to control um, our own country. Um, for yeah. those who are, those who are non-Hawaiians, um, if you want to become part of the country, all you got to do is pledge your allegiance to the country, and you're part of the Hawaiian nation. Um, so I don't have all of the details. I don't understand mm -hmm. all of the legalities of international laws. All I know is that there is a legal process to make sure that there is a slow um, changeover of who's occupying and who's not occupying. Oh, okay, thank you. And I have one other question. Um, before COVID-19 hit, um, the percentage of tourists on the island was 44%, which is above, I think the level it was capped at was supposed to be 33% and then it went up to 43%. And I, I wanna know, um, what you feel are where the place tourism is and how much tourism should we have? Should there be a limit on it? Um, should we uh, diversify and find other um, avenues for our, our people to make money instead of the tourist business and what maybe what they could be? <laughs> um. I can tell you by example, mm -hmm. um, Molokai, we do not depend on tourism. We fought tourism for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, a good example would be those cruise ships, those huge monster ships. Mm -hmm. When they came to Molokai, um, we were like, no way, absolutely no way. So that was like the epitome of being afraid of these tourists. And we decided that no tourist is going to pay to be yelled at. So we thought that that was the Achilles heel of the tourist industry. And sure enough, that's what it was. Because when they came off the boat and they had to come down this narrow wharf road in order to get into our town, we lined that whole road people with signs saying we do not want you here mm. and we didn't yell loud or anything but those signs really spoke a lot for us so that's the Achilles heel um, of tourists they have to be welcome and if they're not welcome um, they're not going to pay to come to any place where they're not welcome so right now there's a huge buzz going on like wow, isn't this great? I can yeah. go down to the beach. Wow, isn't this great? I don't have to go two hours in traffic. You know, people are seeing how great it is not to have tourists buzzing all over the place. So tourism is going to come in, but my guess is that there's going to be a huge difference in the way tourism um, is going to be dealt with. And I'm hoping they're not going to build that waterfall at the at the airport to, to try and entice more tourists to come to Hawaii. And I know the county council tried to limit the budget 
to try and get tourists to come. I thought that was a great idea because I think that's going to be the, the, the what they call the new normal. And it's going to be life without all of these tourists because look at Molokai. We have quality of life over here. We have two economies over here. We can feed our families by going out into the, into the reefs. We have the skills to do that. We can eat as much protein as we want. We have the skills to go into the mountains. And we wouldn't be able to do that if we were dependent on tourism because you go in the mountains and shoot a rifle, 10 tourists would be jumping out and out of the bushes, you know? So we had to make a decision early on what kind of a lifestyle we wanted. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky enough to have the skills to feed ourselves, even though we still need to go to the stores, but we had skills to make our life, our lifestyles livable. We decided early on to know the difference between what we want versus what we need. You watch too much television, you think you need everything and you want everything. I want that brand new truck. If the other guys can have it, why can't I have it? But there's a price to pay and we decided we're not gonna pay that price. We're gonna mm -hmm. go with what we need. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the basis. And we learned all of these kinds of values from our elders mm -hmm. and we decided to follow their lead. Mm -hmm. So tourism, I'm almost positive it's never gonna be the same again in Hawaii. Yes. And I hope each island makes really good decisions on how they're gonna deal with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Walter. Appreciate that. So if someone wants to help you with your campaign, have you, how would they contact, who would they contact and how would they be able to get either, either uh, volunteer to help you or to get funds to you? It's really easy. Just go on really.org <laughs> and there's a whole web page that gives you where you can put your money, who you can call, who I am, all of that stuff is on really.org. And right now, trying to run for office when you're tied to your house and you can't go anywhere, I had a hard time even filing my papers. You know, how do you file papers if you can't get on an airplane? You know, is that an essential worker that you're gonna have to say you are or whatever? So at least the county was kind enough to allow me to do it on the phone and to record my voice on the phone and all that kind of stuff. But running for office during these times, I'm really lucky I have a excellent working group. Um, all the people that I met um, when we were trying to fight GMOs, I met a lot of good people, including some of the faces I see up here on my, my computer. And we tried to figure out how to protect our families for these new corporations coming on our farmlands and just selling more chemicals than they were food or more chemicals than there were seeds. And that took a lot of work and a lot of intuition as to how the government works. I mean, just the fact that they went above the county council, above the mayor, went straight to the people, got enough people signed up, made a, a decision, the mayor go ahead and not listen to it. That just made everybody even more angry, but at least the process provided us with a group of people that understood and understand how the system works. And those are the kinds of people that are helping me right now on Maui. And they're hard workers. Um, I, I don't have to tell them anything. I mean, I don't live in Paia. I have um, what they're in Paia, they know all the people in Paia. Um, I don't know a lot of the people in Haiku, um, but they know a lot of people in Haiku because Haiku people believe the same things we believed in when we were fighting the GMOs. So I do know a lot of people in Kipahulu. I know a lot of people in Hana, Kaupo. We're all country people. They, they're, all our relatives come from those areas. So the team that I put together to campaign, um, I think, has the ability to talk to all of the people that live in the in District 13. Lanai, I can't even go to Lanai. Um, 
um, and I can't go to Maui and I live on Molokai and I can't leave my house. So the incumbent is like way ahead in this game and we have to struggle to figure out how we're gonna get up to that level of recognition that the incumbent has and she doesn't even have to leave her house. So it's been a really interesting um, goal at trying to be um, an elected official. And I don't think, I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be happening for many, many years where we're gonna to have to deal with this um, virus. Um, I don't have any confidence in the president of the United States. I think he's making things worse for all of us. So I'm going to dig down and get ready for a long stay at home. I hear you. I appreciate that. Well, one, speaking of which, um, as we've talked with different candidates and also um, some of the work, I work, work um, with Kelly King on the Climate Action Committee, among other things. And there's been, there's been a movement towards the possibility of having a Maui County Department of Agriculture that's separate from the state so we can start working with different understandings as to what we need within this county. Uh, would you, as a legislator, be, would you back uh, Maui County Department of Agriculture? Yeah, I would do a lot more than that. I would back the new power group that's in our county council. I mean, I want to just hug those guys, you know? I mean, I've gone to the county council for many, many years and you just get so frustrated you know, your three minutes don't do anything. And the people you're talking to, they have a whole different vision of where, where we're all going. So right now, I think Maui County and Kauai County are like the leaders as to what the new norm is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I would put, I would, I would love to work with the county council if I get elected in trying to figure out how we're gonna take care of District 13 and agriculture is gonna get worse. People are still being able to get food in the stores and stuff, but as you watch what's happening nationally with all of these guys working in the, in the meat factories and how they're plowing over all of the agricultural stuff and dumping all of the milk, and it's gonna get harder and harder to feed your family. That's my opinion. So the, the harder it gets to feed your family, the more important agriculture is going to become in this state. For us to depend on barges and airplanes, <laughs> it's insane. The Hawaiians lived in these islands for thousands of years without barges or airplanes, and they had a vibrant culture and a vibrant million of people living on these islands. So it's possible for us to learn how to feed ourselves and to survive without depending on the outside. That's called independence. Thank you for that. It's definitely, it seems to be, you know, it, the consciousness of all the people are beginning to align to that understanding that I remember whenever Uncle, uh, Uncle Sam Kai told me, he said, white boy, he said, you got three days worth of food on the island. You got two weeks worth of fuel. You got 90 days to run the generator. Then you're back like us. So <laughs> that was that was 20 years. It was Sam actually married my wife nine years ago, but it, you know he he became a family member and and watching him and and his vision and his just drive of purpose to get people to understand that they have to connect. It's no longer the dollars you have in your pocket. It's 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 the ability to listen to the land and allow it to be become uh, fruitful because that's what it's there for. Sam talked me about the way that the Hawaiians prayed, which I really, I just take 10 seconds. He said, they go back out and they plant. And they say, okay, God, I plant them. It's your turn. <laughs> and I, I just really realized that, you know, it, that, that's the way you do it. You, you don't wait for something to happen. You go out and you get things to, uh, done. And, uh, and I appreciate, as I listen to you more, your capacity and understanding and deep understanding of that through a lifetime of service to listen to the now, to that other side of what's possible. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce. Yes, Uncle Walter. Yes. Uh, last election, the big buzzword was affordable housing. And that was what everyone was buzzing around. And this year, I'm 
perceiving that it will be around, you know, people who've lost their economy and restoring economic. Now, your district is probably of all of Maui the least impacted by tourism because it's the most local district and not within the tourist belt. Uh, but how would you how would you deal with restarting this economy and and setting it in the right direction from what you can do at the state level? Well, <clears throat> every island has is has different abilities to do different things. So one of the ideas we have here on Molokai, we're a country, country island. So what is economic development? Um, people fly over our island in jets all the time um, with economic development floating in their heads and dollar signs floating in their heads. And for some reason, they bypassed our island and we're glad. Um, so what that has done is given us a chance to develop two economies on Molokai. Instead of just the cash economy, we've developed a subsistence economy. So we have like 14,000 acres of reef. And we spawn those reefs and we double the capacity of those, those uh, reefs to provide us with enough protein. And all you had to do was have the skills to walk on that reef or to go on that reef and to get that protein. And we still have those skills. On the north shore of our island, we have these cliffs. Next, and in between the cliffs are these valleys. And this is where our kupuna, our elders went first. They didn't go to the dry side where there was no water. They were that stupid. They went into the valleys where there were rivers of pristine rivers with millions. Each of our rivers in the valleys on Molokai, between two and five million gallons a day flow through those rivers. And you can still drink those, wa those waters today. From one wall to the other wall is infrastructure. Their terror terraces, intact, untouched, ready to be worked. The problem was in the 1840s, we had these diseases like we're having right now, came and decimated the Hawaiian community. We went from 900,000 to a million people all the way down to like 40,000 people, total decimation. We lost our workforce for these fish ponds. We lost our workers for the, for the valleys and all of the taro and starches that were produced. But the infrastructure is still there. So our idea is in order for us to get to the future we want, we need to look back and see what happened in the past to guide us into the future. And that's what we're doing on Molokai. And that's what the whole world is beginning to see that you need indigenous cultures to guide your future economics because you gave it to the extraction guys and they've extracted to the max point where the mother earth is kicking back and kicking your ass hard enough to wake you up that you cannot keep extracting, extracting, extracting. Somehow it has to be reversed and that's where the Hawaiians come in and their culture, they considered themselves part of the land. They are the land. The land is them. The land is the chief. You have to make sure that the future generations have everything that is given to us today belongs to them. Those kinds of values allow everlasting life. So that's the kind of values that the Hawaiians can bring to the table. Independence and able to make sure your future generations can live here forever. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Daniel, do you have something next? Yeah, sort of to continue on that question. Um, you know, you spoke a bit about these, these two economies, this cash and this subsistence from the Aina itself. And when it comes to the affordable housing that Bruce had asked, um, a lot of times that goes hand in hand with this um, houseless situation, the homeless, the houseless, the shelterless. When it comes to 
looking back to indigenous cultures and letting the past guide the future, what what can you share with us about the homeless situation? Well, I had a hard time understanding what is a house. Is it something that you want to build in order to have equity, in order to to get more, you can go and borrow more money. So it has to be cost $500,000 or whatever. I'll tell you a little story. I, I was going to Hana one day, my wife and I, and we got off the, uh, at the airport and we decided we we're gonna walk into Hana town. So we started walking and I looked up and I saw this beautiful nest that this, br this bird was building. I mean, it was beautiful. And I said, said to myself, shit, if, if a bird can build a house, why can't I build my house? And I didn't know how to build a house. So when I came back to Molokai, um, I was lucky enough to have Hawaiian homelands. And I went on the land and I gave a hammer to my boys and a sickle to my wife. And we started cutting all the grass and started going down to the ocean and cutting logs, mangrove logs. And we started building our house. Today, what, 20 plus years later, um, I'm, I'm living in the house. It cost me $20,000. And we've been here for, for 15, 20 years in this house, happy as ever. I wanted a house. I didn't want some elaborate thing that I'm going to be in debt for the rest of my life. I had that opportunity, but I decided, no, I'm going to live in a simple house. So for me, that's, that's how I understand housing. And I don't understand the complexities of how all the developers build all these units all together in one place. And I don't understand all of that. But somehow, we got to redefine what a house is and build things that people can actually afford and are willing to live in. Otherwise, I don't understand how we're gonna solve the problem. All I know is that for Hawaiians, we have little under 200,000 acres for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And a huge amount of people that are now on the streets are Hawaiians. And we have all of this land and yet the Hawaiians are on the streets. So we go back to the constitutional mandate. They're not giving OHA the 20% and OHA could use that 20% to make sure that people get houses on Hawaiian homelands because we already have 200,000 acres. So those are some of the things I hope we can solve in order to help resolve this housing problem. Um, on Molokai, we do not have a homeless problem. We got a couple guys without a house, but they live with, with families. So I don't have a specific answer, but I have some idea. Oh, that, that, was, that, was, uh, that was a great answer. Mahalo for that. And I saw that Paul had, Paul had something to add on to that. Okay. Well, actually, it's a little bit different, but um, uh, what I have, Walter, is, is around the education system that we have and the way it's structured. And right now we have our tax money goes over to Oahu. Our education system is Oahu centric. And it seems like a lot of the money that goes there gets lost in administrative fees and costs. And then what comes back to support the teachers and also the infrastructure of the schools just doesn't seem to be there. And as a result, we have a, a large number of, of teachers leaving after a short time period, or we are here with part-time teachers who have not had the education, uh, you know, most of them in terms of being teachers and, and certified teachers. What's your stance on how to deal with this Oahu-centric system, and is there alternatives that you would suggest? Well, what scared the hell out of me was when the governor said that in order to solve the problem, the pandemic, budget problem is we're going to cut the, the pay of the teachers. That was like the first 
round of of gunfire coming out of out of the government was against the teachers and to me the teachers got to realize that holy crap we're we're the first in line to get cut here so for me education is the is absolute must we there's many many problems um with the educational system and the teachers have a union um they're organized but they're not appreciated for us as hawaiians in order for us to have a better future we need to educate the whole state of hawaii about how we were nationalized the nationalization is going to be important how we were americanized how we were told that the hawaiians had a a culture that was pagan and we threw people in the volcanoes and we were pagans and all this kind of stuff that was part of our educational system so we have to figure out how to get control over that system in order to get the truth out so education become really really important if we're going to go where we need to go so when i was growing up here on molokai i was a basketball coach i was a volleyball coach i was to teacher i spent 2 years um with all of the kids that were dropping through the net and going them to the streets um we organized all of the elementary schools here on molokai to come together for makahiki games instead of only playing basketball and baseball and for 40 years is the greatest event the biggest event on molokai because all of the schools have to have go through a whole process for a month and a half to find out their champions in each of the schools in each of the grades and then send those champions over to the event that we hold once a year that took a lot of organizing within the school system so i know we can we can organize the school system to get what we want so when we used to go to molokai high school as parents we went there and we just went there to school our kids or to participate now you go to there and there's no need if you want to park there's too many police cars in the in the parking lot and if you want to go and see your kids you have to go in and get a pass and then there's all these security guys discipline takes up 60% of the time for the teachers in the classroom i don't see how they can even teach all i'm saying is that there's a lot of problems my solution is we have to get the parents back into the educational system we cannot just depend on laws and funding you know or we're going to tax put um take some of the, the land tax monies oh no you're not taking going to tax our lands more for education we're going to have to do it another way because a lot of our kupuna are losing their lands because they can't pay the taxes on the land so what is the solution for me the solution is going to be bringing the parents it's your kids it's not a daycare center it's an educational system and you're part of it so somehow we got to get the resources from the community and the school to be working with the resources in the community to get the kind of education that we need to get a uh, a question walter just in terms of right now we're oahu centric in terms of the way the schools are administered what about having it be so that it be more county based yeah, and we well, have a school district within each county i'm for i'm for any kind of an idea because it's not working it is not working and the county is going to have to prove that they have the ability to provide that and i don't think anybody is going to be able to provide the kinds of funds unless the parents get involved in the education you're going to get you're not going to get the kind of education that you think you're getting if you're not involved so we we can't keep depending on the government on everything in this case it's our kids we have a responsibility and we got to start organizing our parents again like they used to be organized in in the schools and then everybody was working too hard didn't have time it just fell all apart and we we relied on elected officials and we got a mess in our educational system so much so that they're going to start cutting the 
teachers pay as the first um, solution to the pandemic. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for that response. And uh, is there, Laura, did you have any other questions or anyone else on our panel, if you want to raise your hand also? Uh, we have two more questions left uh, before our time's up. Okay. Uh, Laura, were you going to go on or, or not? No? Okay. Uh, any other last questions? I think I think Walter said it all. I mean, <laughs> the, the one thing the one thing Walter is that um, you know I'm humbled by listening to you. We've I've, I've had over 20 years of, of interviewing people, hundreds of people for um, county, state, um, and local government. And um, there's a certain point where you understand that that there are people that that really, in my this is just my opinion that that need to be part of the part of the dialogue because they bring such an extraordinary amount of, of understanding to that dialogue. Um, and I really do appreciate you stepping forward at this time. I think the timing is impeccable. I think uh, the, 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 the place that you're running for is, is very, very important. And um, I look forward to this, you know, few weeks of race that, that, that are set up, you know, between now and when the Democratic uh, 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 whenever they, when people have a chance to, uh, to vote. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll turn it over to Bayos. Bruce, go ahead. Walter, um, the incumbent has uh, Hawaiian lands on Molokai that are, as my understanding, leased lands, uh, a significant acreage of it which now she has sublet to Monsanto. Would you explain to me that situation and the feelings about that on the people of Molokai? Um, <clears throat> well, she leases uh, Department of Hawaiian Homelands um, and she and her family had been planting sweet potato for many, many years and they were always Put up as being an example of success on Hawaiian homelands for, for farming. Um, that was her father's generation. And then she took over the farm from her father. And somehow um, one day we saw all of the um, workers from Monsanto, now it's Bear. Um, with their equipment on her land. So she's saying to the department that she's actually growing the corn and somehow either selling it, I don't know all of the details, but she's the one who's growing it. But we drive by every day and all the equipment and a lot of the workers are Monsanto and bear workers. So to there's a lot of discussion and people are not happy about you leasing lands on, ho on homestead lands and then subleasing it. I don't, know, I don't even know if that's legal. So maybe that's why she's claiming that she's not subleasing it, she's actually growing the corn. But that's a situation um, that's happening here on, on Molokai. And I think she has also a lot of um, other lands that she's bought from other Hawaiians, because Hawaiians can actually sell their leases. So I don't want to say too much because I don't want to be like the boogeyman or the bad guy going after her. But that's what I understand right now. Thank you, Walter, uh, for that. And uh, we will be, uh, right after our interview with Walter, we will be talking about Linda Coit and, and uh, her records, her voting records, and other issues like we just mentioned just now. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and again, uh, I, I want to remind our viewers that if you would like to plug in to help the candidates, there's many ways you can do that. And we're going to be starting in about uh, three weeks. We'll be starting phone banks. If you are into editing videos, we certainly could use help and bring that help over to the different candidates. Uh, and again, Walter, if you want to mention your website and how they can get in touch with you and how they can uh, donate also, if you could mention that. 
Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's really easy to help and we sure need a lot of help. It's really hard to run for office staying at home. So if any way you can help um, and you want to go to ready.org and all of the information is there at ready.org um, where you can help. And we have a really good team. They're wait, waiting um, to be called. They can bring signs to your house. They can do all kinds of things to help um, you get elected. And we do need help on this one.